before we have prayer, I promised you a joke. <laughs> An old geezer, none of, none, there's no old geezers in here. An old geezer, retired farmer, became very bored and decided to open a medical clinic. He got a building, used one of his buildings, and he put up a sign outside that said, Dr. Geezer's Clinic. Get your treatment for $500. If not cured, get back $1,000. Dr. Young, in town, who was positive that this old geezer didn't know beans about medicine, thought this would be a great opportunity to get $1,000. So he went, he was first patient, to Dr. Geezer's Clinic. Dr. Young, Dr. Geezer went into the in room, into the examination room. Dr. Young, who he didn't know was a doctor, said, Dr. Geezer, I've lost all the taste in my mouth. Can you please help me? Dr. Geezer looked at his nurse, said, please bring medicine from box 22 and put three, doc three drops in Dr. Young's mouth. His nurse came in put three drops on the tongue of Dr. Young, who screamed, ah, that's gasoline. <laughs> Dr. Geezer said, congratulations. You've got, you've got your taste back. That'll be $500. Dr. Young's not done. He gets annoyed and goes back after a couple days, figuring to recover his money. He goes in and Dr. Geezer recognizes him, comes into the examination room. He said, Dr. Geezer, I've lost my memory. I can't remember anything. Dr. Geezer turned to his nurse, said, nurse, please bring medicine from box 22 and put three drops in the patient's mouth. <laughs> oh, no, you don't, Dr. Young said. That's gasoline. Congratulations. You've got your memory back. That'll be $500. Dr. Young, after having lost $1,000, is determined to get his money back. So he goes back one more time. Dr. Geezer walks into the room. Dr. Young, he said, you're here again? He said, yes. My eyesight has become so weak, I can hardly see anything. After a few moments, Dr. Geezer said, well, I don't have any medicine for that. Here's your $1,000 back. And he gave him $20. Dr. Young said, this is only $20. He said, congratulations, you've got your vision back. That'll be another $500. <laughs> Dr. Geezer's clinic. All right, I wasted, I wasted four minutes on that, but I, I, I thought that was pretty good. I was actually working out when I had that on my headset and that joke was being told and I was laughing all over the gym and people were kind of looking at me like, that, man, that man's on something. He's working out and smiling. Well, Lord, we thank you for today. We thank you for your living word. We thank you that we can gather here today and we can learn from your spirit those things that will enable us to live a victorious life here in the guidance and under the direction of your Holy Spirit. We ask Holy Spirit for your help, your direction. May you enlighten our minds and open our understanding. May everything be said that should be said. Grant, I pray, this for the glory of Jesus. Amen. All right, part four. <clears throat> and uh, this is what I have in front of me. So some of you can read that. Congratulations, you owe me $500. <clears throat> So we're going to cover just a couple of basic topics today that I thought would be uh, helpful to perhaps summarize and sew at least most, most of this up. And we have not talked about this, we've not spoken about this, but we've talked about the reality, we have covered the reality of the gifts of healing. And I want you to notice that it's in plural, that the word, it is not gift of healing, the Bible refers to it as gifts of healing. In consideration of that, and the, and the Greek language is very specific, it is in the plural for us in English, it would be 
what we would call in the plural context. And <clears throat> gifts, then, one commentator said, is an indication and a reminder that it isn't that one person has a certain type of a gift of healing. They can heal, that God uses them. We don't heal anyone, but God uses them through them, manifests the gift through them to heal colds. Another individual has uh, the gift of healing to heal cancer. It isn't that. That is not what's being referred to. It is the multiplicity and a, a number of various healings that flow through an individual um, as the Spirit manifests these gifts through them. In other words, through the individual, people receive gifts of healing. So the individual has no claim on possession of it. It is not the gift of healing where they can say, I have the gift of healing. Rather, it is gifts of healings indicating that the person, as we will see, the Holy Spirit manifests himself in and through human vessels, that that individual is merely a human vessel through which gifts flow, gifts of healings flow to other people. So, how does one receive the gifts of healing? And we're going to reiterate here, if we could quickly, 1 Corinthians 12, 7 through 9, 1 Corinthians 12, 28, 28 and 1 Corinthians 12, 30. By the way, those are 1 Corinthians 12, is a very good treatise on the gifts of the Spirit. And it is, um, 1 Corinthians 13 is sandwiched in between 1 Corinthians 12 and 1 Corinthians 14, obviously. Both of them dealing somewhat with gifts. And 13 is a reminder that love is the greatest way. And that everything that God gives is to be ministered in love and that we're to live in love. So the Bible says in 1 Corinthians 12, 7 through 9, and I'm going to cut right into the middle of it. To one there is given the Spirit a message of wisdom, to another a message of knowledge by means of the same Spirit, to another faith by the same Spirit, to another gifts of healings by that one Spirit, capital S, the Holy Spirit of God. And remember again, the manifestation of the gifts of the Spirit are through people. And we'll get on into this more a little bit later. Sometimes it is almost like God, uh, it is almost like drinking water. The water may be pure, but sometimes we get the taste of the pipe. Did you ever drink out of a hose? <laughs> I, think, I think about the fact that now we have to buy our water purified. If you'd have told me water someday would cost more than gasoline, I'd have never believed you. But, it, but that we're, we're all worried about the quality of our water. And I think back about the ch child abuse that I endured when I was a kid. Mom and Dad tell me, go get a drink out of the hose. And I'd, we're, we're chugging, the neighbor boys and I are chugging out of that hose. you remember what that tasted like? You get the taste of the hose. Well, it's the same situation in regards to the flowing of the gifts of the Spirit. God has chosen to work in cooperation with humanity. And the Spirit of God has chosen to work through the body of Christ, which, in case you haven't checked recently, is made up of fallible human beings. And so the Holy Spirit works through people. And in 1 Corinthians 12, 28, again, it's reiterated, God placed for church first all apostles, second prophets, third teachers, then miracles, then gifts of healings. And then finally, in verse 30, there's a question asked. It's a redundant question. Do all have gifts of healings? Paul is seeking for an answer that obviously he's pressing for the answer, no. Not everyone has gifts of healing. So we also need to differentiate very quickly between the gifts of healing as bestowed by the Spirit of God and the medical community that we may have great, you may have great admiration for your, your physician, your nurse practitioner, whoever it is, that their ability and their learning and training does not necessarily indicate that they have gifts, the gifts of healing. Uh, being in the medical community no more qualifies you to be a recipient of the gifts of healing than being a plumber or a carpenter or a bookkeeper. So simply because someone is a physician and skillful 
or in part of the medical community and learned and has a gift of intelligence and even compassion does not mean they could have. They could have the gifts of healing, but let us recognize the gifts of healing are not natural, they are supernatural. And they affect a supernatural impact in an individual. All of the gifts mentioned in the scripture are, are supernatural. They transcend a natural ability. Sometimes we confuse ability with a gift, and we say that. We may say Owen is gifted to play the bells. And in a, in a natural sense, that is true. But the Bible, in referring to the gifts of the Spirit, nowhere is indicating that, there's a, there, that it is natural in its origination. It is supernatural and is given to individuals after they are born again. It is subsequent to becoming a Christian that an individual is bestowed with a supernatural gift or gifts of healings. So, number, so how does one receive the gifts of healing? We're going to have to move very quickly. First of all, the Bible tells us the Holy Spirit decides. <coughs> the Holy Spirit decides. 1 Corinthians 12, 11. Very, very clear. All these are the work of the one and same Spirit, and He distributes them to each one just as He determines. Just as He determines. The Holy Spirit is in charge. He chooses individuals um, as he decides. So there's a divine side and there's a human side. By the way, in the operation of these gifts, there is also a divine, what I would call a divine dance that's taking place, if we may, between the Spirit of God and human will and human obedience. The Spirit of God may impress upon an individual that this person needs to be prayed for. I want you to pray for them for healing. But that individual, that vessel still has a will and still has a choice. The gifts of the Spirit never take over someone. They don't possess someone. The devil possesses people. The Spirit of God works in cooperation with our will. And so it will always, even if you have or you believe you have a certain gift that you've noticed that God works in you or you sense that at times, you know things that you know things about people after you've been born again all of a sudden you you know that that could be a word of knowledge and there's a difference there between that and prophecy but acting upon that word of knowledge is totally dependent upon not only the guidance of the holy spirit being sensitive to the spirit of god and a relationship with god hearing him but also it, it's dependent upon your will what does god want and then there's the interpretation of the usage of the gift well, okay, I know this about this person. It's been laid upon my heart. What do I do now? See, sometimes we, there's skill in learning to utilize the gift of a, a gift, a gift of the Spirit. Just as Owen is talented, I'm glad these are up here today. Owen is talented, but he had to work. It's totally natural for us, and in fact normal, that we recognize he's had to work countless hours to be able to do this. Now, some of us could have worked the same amount of hours as he did, and we would not want to hear you play the bells. <laughs> right? Some, some of us think we can sing. And, we, and keep it to the shower, okay? Keep it in there. So, so the gifts of the Spirit are the same way. The gift of teaching, for example, that takes development and maturity. And so you have to mature a gift. You can operate. You learn how to operate in that gift. All right, I'm getting a little bit off to the... Well, let, let's use an illustration here where Paul talks about that it works in cooperation. The gift works in cooperation with the person. 1 Corinthians 14, 32, the church, the Corinthian church, as I said before, gave Paul fits. He, he just about, if he had any hair, he tore it out uh, with dealing with these people. And there were the gifts of the Spirit, the Holy Spirit, did not give the gifts according to maturity, that's obvious, because he gifted the church, the people in Corinth. And they were some of the most immature people we have recorded in the Bible. And yet the gifts of the Spirit were evidently operating in their gatherings. But it became chaos. And he had certain individuals, evidently, that had the gift of prophecy and and they were claiming that whenever the Spirit of God moved on them, they had to jump up and interrupt the service and give the prophecy. And Paul said, no. He said, disorder is not of God, 
The confusion's not of God. And he said in 1 Corinthians 14, 32, the spirits of the prophets are subject to the control of the prophets. So there you see the will of man and the guidance and direction and, and presence of the Holy Spirit operating in conjunction with one another. So the Holy Spirit decides, number one. Number two, the gifts of the Spirit or the gifts of healings and all gifts actually um, can come as an answer and a response from God it, to those seeking and asking. It's very interesting, the Bible tells us in more than one place that we are to eagerly, 1 Corinthians 12, 31, eagerly desire the greater gifts. We're to eagerly desire them, we're to seek them. Paul told the Corinthian church, of all people, you know, it, it, dealing with the chaos he was dealing with and the confusion he was dealing with, Paul, it would have been very easy for Paul to say, time out, we're not going this gift's direction any longer, stop it. But instead, Paul doesn't stop it. He recognizes the gifts of the Spirit are necessary for the church to take ground and the church to do supernatural acts which are needed because we have a supernatural foe who's called the devil. And Paul tells him in 1 Corinthians 14, 1 again, follow the way of love and eagerly desire spiritual gifts. Now there's a church, the gifts of the Spirit and the operation of the gifts of the Spirit has caused many a controversy in churches and in congregations, the operation of those gifts, so much so that it has caused some denominations to say, just like I said, time out. We're going to operate on the fruit of the Spirit, the gifts of the Spirit, and they have adopted the cessationist view of Benjamin War Warwick, who said they're done for today. And to them, that's a great relief. We're glad those are all done. Forget it. No operation of gifts in our church. And they adopt that. In fact, the Missionary Alliance Church, to which is A.B. Simpson, who was a wonderful man and the founder of the Missionary Alliance Church, Christian Missionary Alliance Church, their doctrinal stance regarding the gifts, their official stance is, seek not, forbid not. Seek not, forbid not. That's unbiblical. The Bible clearly says you're to seek them. So now taking that stance is an obvious step in trying to, okay, we're not going to get involved in this. And so we're just going to, but that is an immature stance, to be honest with you. It takes maturity to deal with the operation of the gifts of the Spirit. So, I've said all that to say this, the Bible is very clear then, if we are to seek the gifts of the Spirit, the, the greater gifts, if we're to seek the gifts of the Spirit, then there is an indication that that seeking could result in the reception of a gift. In fact, I believe one of the clear indications, if it is not for a selfish purpose, of an individual, perhaps God guiding them in a direction of a certain <coughs> gift, is they indicate a deep desire within themselves. They have a deep desire. For example, the gifts of healings, that individual has a deep desire to see people healed. Not, uh, uh, not that others don't, we do, but that person has just almost an inordinate desire. That, they pray about that a lot. It's, he, we've got to see this person healed. I've got to care for this person. And, they, and they, they're constantly checking on people and they're constantly, that could be an indication that God has bent your heart or their heart towards the gifts of healing. And, and as you seek that, it might be that God's spirit, only he decides, would bestow those, that, that, the gifts of healing. And then lastly, I would say to you, venture forth. One way that we find out and perhaps receive <clears throat> and we find out if God is operating in gifts of healings, if there is a desire there, the best way to test whether God has given this particular gift is to step out in faith. And so step out in faith and begin to pray for individuals, begin to minister to individuals. And again, this would take a whole class time period for us to recognize that it takes wisdom, maturity, and common sense for the practice and the operation of a gift. You just don't force it on people. You don't walk up to someone and say, hey, and, uh, and, and you've seen them on TV smacking people in the head. And, you know, no, that is, 
you, you with their, may I pray with you? Would you mind if I prayed with you? Or I've even had an individual say, I hope you don't mind, but I've been praying for your healing. I've been praying that God would heal. Well, thank you. And that helps to open the door and then gives opportunity for you to see whether this gift is in operation or not. How do we know, again, I'm glad these are up here. How do we know that Owen has a natural human ability to play these bells? You've heard him. He can do it. How do we know if someone has a certain spiritual gift? You'll know them by their fruit. I mean, the, the, the gift will produce fruit. There will be a manifestation. Manifestation coming from the Greek word manifest. Manifest is a picture word which means to pull the curtain back. Someone's behind a curtain and they pull the curtain back. You know, like the person who's doing, uh, telling Joe Biden what to do uh, behind the curtain. I'm sorry, couldn't resist. Venture forth. No, remember the Bible does not indicate that all divine healings, and we'll cover this in a few moments, take place only through the gifts of healings. Nowhere does the Bible indicate that. The gifts of healings, the gift of healings is a more prominent and powerful manifestation. But tremendous healings can take place when we pray for people to be healed in answer to prayer. And if not, God would have never instructed us in James, the fifth chapter, as we talked about last week, that the elders, to gather the elders and to pray. Are any, any among you sick? Gather the elders of the church. Pray. Anoint them with oil. All right. Pray for each other so that you may be healed. All right. Number two, why doesn't God heal? This is probably the big this is the big stinker in the room. Why doesn't God heal? If a healing does not occur, does this necessarily mean that, number one, the gifts of healing, healing is no longer operative today? Or number two, does it indicate that the person praying and ministering does not have or does not possess the gifts of healing? No. The answer to that is no. And for several reasons and more, this isn't, this isn't a definitive list here, folks. This isn't an all-inclusive list. But let me give you some that, that came to me and that in my studies I would offer to you today. Number one, why doesn't God heal? The person needing a healing may not have the faith to receive. Let me, let me qualify everything I'm saying with the fact that there are exceptions. That's what makes this subject so interesting and so confusing. There are exceptions. But sometimes the person receiving healing may not have the faith to receive. You remember that we talked about Mark the 6th chapter, verses 5 and 6. Jesus went back to his own hometown. And he could not do mighty works there except that he laid his hands upon a few sick people and healed them. We would love to have that level of healing in our church today. And the Bible's downplaying that. Said he couldn't do much there. Why couldn't he do it? It goes on to say, and he marveled because of their unbelief. <clears throat> God has sometimes in the past used individuals in my life, no one here, well he's used you in my life, but I mean I'm not referring to anyone here, but individuals that God sent to me and had I been choosing, they would not have been the person that I would have allowed to minister to me or even receive the fact that God was speaking and working through them. It just, not that I didn't like them, but in some cases, it was like, there is no way. And yes, and sometimes God will choose people. I remember one service in particular, I don't want to get off base here, but because this could take some time, but we were, we were visiting a church in Cincinnati, Ohio, a large church. 
And <clears throat> it was in the midst of God moving in that church. We didn't, and we didn't, uh, we just wanted to attend the church because we heard the pastor preach and I wanted to hear him. Well, we came in late. It was a large auditorium, seated 1,500 to 2,000 people. We sat up almost under the balcony, slipped in, nobody knew us. We sat down. And to my disappointment, the pastor was not there. He was on vacation. So it was a guest speaker. This guy got up, and I don't know why. It's just, and, and he, he may not have cared for me either. I just didn't care for him. I didn't care for his mannerisms. He kind of strutted out, you know, and, and I thought, oh boy. And I didn't say that, I didn't groan or anything. I behaved myself. <laughs> but I thought, oh, so bad decision, bad decision to come tonight. And I'm gonna tell you one of the most astonishing things happened God gave this man, to my astonishment, what the Bible calls a word of knowledge. He's in the middle of preaching. Well, going back and forth, way down there, all of a sudden, my wife was there, she can confirm, I'm not telling stories. All of a sudden, he turned and he pointed, and up in the congregation, <clears throat> and I thought, he said, sir, and I thought, Wow, that looks like he's pointing at me, but it's not me because I'm, I don't go here. And he said, sir, he said, you in the blue shirt. And I went, <laughs> and he went, yes, you in the blue shirt. And he began to read my mail and tell me, about things in my life. I went. And I walked out of that place with my mouth still hanging open. And it's an, it's, it's, it reveals that God uses vessels sometimes that we wouldn't choose. Maybe even somebody we don't particularly care for. And he worked his spirit through that man. And he went right back to preaching. Never missed a, never missed a beat. Now, what, as I was saying, he went on. My whole, my whole attitude towards that man changed, right? So faith, he could not work there because of unbelief. Faith has something to do with it. You remember, I, we need to keep moving. There's a scripture that I don't have down on here. I'm not going to give you. I, I can't recall where it's found. But as you study the New Testament, you remember there was the one child that had died Peter went to the funeral, they were all wailing, and he came, and when he got there, he said, the child is not dead, merely asleep, and they all laughed. Do you remember that? <clears throat> now, he was not saying the child was in a coma. The child was dead. He was just saying, I'm going to wake her up. <coughs> and they all laughed, and he went into the room, and he put the family out. He went into the hospital room, and he said, get out. Told the whole family to get out. Nurses, everybody, get out. And he took three people in with him, his inner circle. Why did he take those people in and kick those people out? He wanted faith in the room. He wanted an atmosphere of faith. So faith has much to do. How many times, read your New Testament, your faith has made you whole. Your faith, your faith, your faith, your faith. So sometimes the individual may not have faith. In Acts 14, 9 and 10, we have an account where Paul was speaking and while he was preaching, somewhat similar, this is a word of, word of knowledge, somewhat similar to what the man did in my own particular case. Paul is preaching and he looked directly at a man who was lame. And it says, he saw that he had faith to be healed. Something about this person, when he looked at them and he was preaching, he saw, saw that he had faith to be healed. That was a word of knowledge. And he said, said to him, stand up on your feet. At that, the man jumped up and began to walk. So he rec there was the recognition of faith. Sometimes we're praying for people that have no faith. They do not believe God can heal. That doesn't always stop healing, but it can have an impact. Number two, there may, God may not heal because there may be a sin, sin barrier. There may be sin acting as a barrier that needs to be taken care of and forgiven before that healing occurs. The Bible says in James 5.16, Therefore confess your sins to each other and pray for each other. Why? So that you may be healed. 
Sin can act as a barrier, particularly unforgiveness and bitterness can act as a barrier to forgiveness and therefore to healing. The Bible says in Mark 11, 24 and 25, if you hold anything against anyone, forgive them so that your Father in heaven may forgive you for your sins. And he says that right after he's talking about receiving in prayer. I'm convinced that some people do not receive healing because they're holding unforgiveness and bitterness in their heart. This is a ledger that I carried around with me. It's falling apart, but I brought it today. This is a ledger that I carried around with me, and I kept record of every message I preached, how many people I prayed with, and even comments over here, everywhere I went as we traveled around the nation. Great freedom and conviction. I said on 9-5, Harder resistance, but a good altar service. Easy to preach, but little conviction. Small crowd. Hard to preach. Weird. <laughs> In here, if I can find it quickly, 1994, that, bless you, Gesundheit is in response to the fact that Germans thought demons caused you to sneeze. Uh, in here, I have, and I've got to find it, on March 20th, 1994. Hard to believe I've been preaching that long. March 20th, 1994, canceled due to, si due to snow. Um, Tiffin, Wendell Shepherd, pastor. I also did the music I have in here. Preached on philosophy of prayer, the necessary vision the third, second night, philosophy of prayer the third night, philosophy of prayer the fourth night, then worship and praise on Saturday night, and Sunday morning I preached, Are You Bored? Church... I put, was bound by Satan, dramatically transformed, my wife remembers this church, dramatically transformed by tremendous healing, John on Sunday morning. That Sunday morning I was preaching and it was just as hard as it has always been. I could barely get my thoughts. The enemy was fighting to such a degree I could barely get one word after another. Just hard. My, my pastor's wife used to call it sweating cough drops. And, and got to the end, and I'd had it. And I decided I was going to take authority. And I did something I'd never done. It was a risky procedure. Because if it didn't work, it was... But I said, we have no freedom. You have no freedom in this church. And in the name of Jesus, I set you free. And I declared that they were free. I said, you, and I, I came against the devil with my mouth. Now that blew some of those Sunday morning church people away. This guy's crazy. But when I did that, the atmosphere changed. And I said, stand up. And I said, I'm going to give an invitation. And those of you that need to come, you're free to come now. People began to flood to that altar. There was total freedom. A man came who had been there every night. His name was John, obviously. And a ceiling, a roof had caved in on him. It had crushed his skull. It had broken several bones. It had destroyed his hearing. It had given him a heart problem because of what he faced. They literally pulled him out. His arm was hanging out, arm or leg. And a neighbor came over, I can't remember which. And they pulled him out from under the, the rubble. And they saved his life. But he walked with crutches, the type of braces that you put your arms down in. That's how he walked. And that church was on the second floor. The Tiffin Church was on the second floor. And they had put an elevator in so that that man could attend services. And, and he could get up to the second floor. I watched him all week walk in. He and his wife, they sat over here where Rebecca's sitting. That morning when I said, you're free, come down. If you need to pray, he made his way down and he made his way right here. It was a larger church sanctuary. <clears throat> and I'm praying with people. He's just one of many. I was glad to see him respond. 
But actually the whole front of the church was full. So I'm praying for individuals. And I felt impressed to pray that if you are holding bitterness against anyone or unforgiveness, I believe we need to pray. You need to pray about that. And I led in that prayer. And John was seated there second in, and his wife was next to him on the end. And after I finished and said, Amen, his arm shot up in the air like that. I thought, he's rejoicing. His wife jumped up, stood at the end of the aisle, and began to do this. And I did not know that the man had not raised his arms ever since that accident. He could not raise his arms. And they went, choom. So I've got to cut to the chase. We witnessed and I witnessed a biblical proportion miracle. That man, by the end of the service, when we, I was leaving, raced me down the steps. Crutches were thrown away. Raced me down, up and down the steps. You want to know what people would act like in the Bible after they were healed? I saw it. I mean, he was beside himself. That church began to weep. Those people began to cry. They saw this man. They knew. We went to lunch at the pastor's house, which was you know, common in that day. They'd invite you over to the pastor's house. They invited this man and his wife. He would not shut up. <laughs> Talked about what God had done during the whole meal. And I'm sitting there, and I'm doing like some of you. I'm, I'm going, after, after I ate, I've got to preach that night. He still, but, I, and so I'm, I'm asking him. I said, what? Oh, took his hearing aids. He had two big battery pack hearing aids here. Took them out, threw them away. And I said, well, tell me again what happened to you. I remember sitting where I was sitting. He said, this roof caved in on me. He said, they actually had to remove a portion of my skull. I'm still waiting on a plate to be. God had filled that man's head in with a new skull. So we had a whole shouting, rejoicing, another episode there in the living room of that house. I said, I need documentation of this because people will not believe it. And so he went to the doctor and he sent me the copies of the medical reports of where the doctor said, you had this and you don't anymore. You had this, you don't anymore. Forgiveness. He said the moment he forgave the people responsible for not keeping the building the way it should have been after he had told them over and over and over again there was structural damage and they refused to and it caved in on him. The moment he forgave them, that's when healing came. That's what was blocking. So that's not theoretical with me. I witnessed that in Tiffin, Ohio in 1994. So barriers, oh man, we're at 10, 12. Now, we have to not jump to conclusions. Again, let me caution us. Well, I've been praying for this person. I've been praying for my family member. They must not be forgiving someone. We have to be careful. This is a mysterious thing. Healing is hard to, for us to understand sometimes. Uh, what was her name? Catherine Kuhlman. I remember hearing that I read a book about her. By the way, I met people that, were, that received healing in her that was real deal. One lady told me the story and it was incredible. You know, she was a strange woman. God, you, you remember hearing her? <laughs> Have you been waiting on me? You remember? And yet God worked through that woman. We may not agree with her theology, but God used her. There was healing. By the way, how do you judge? You say, well, the devil may have been doing those things. Why would the devil heal to give glory to Jesus? That's about it. He's dumb, but he's not that dumb, right? And so Catherine Kuhlman, they said, recorded, she would sometimes go back out onto the stage after everyone had left. Amazing miracles had taken place for hours. And she would go back out and would tears streaming down her face. And, and because she was remembering the people that weren't healed. And they said she would cry out, why God? Why? Why was that person healed and that little baby wasn't? 
Why? And they said the tears would just stream down her face. We don't know why. What do we do when we don't know? We go back to what I call the givens. And I've had to go there many times. The givens are what I do know. If I don't understand what's going on, when I cannot trace God's hand, C.H. Spurgeon said, I can trust his heart. When I cannot trace his hand, I can't figure out what is going on, why, I can trust his heart. What does the Bible say? Base number one in the baseball diamond, God is love. God is love. He doesn't have love, he is love. So when I can't understand, I can go back to that and I can rest in that. I don't understand this. It doesn't, it doesn't make any sense to me. I could argue with you, God, over it, but you tell me your love. Okay? Got to get through it. Sometimes God desires to use... By the way, in John 9, 2, look it up sometime, the, the rabbis and the Pharisees thought that sin was always connected with um, sickness. And that's why in John 9, 2, the, the disciples came to Jesus and the man that was blind for, from birth, and they said, who sinned, this man or his parents? Remember that? Yeah. Got to be sin here. We should be careful we're not Pharisees. And we look at someone that wasn't healed that we pray for and say, eh, they must have been. No, careful. Jesus said, neither this man nor his parents sinned, but, the, but that the glory of God might be made manifest in him. Okay? Sometimes God desires to use natural means rather than a supernatural touch and wisdom. So sometimes God doesn't supernaturally touch someone and answer, for, for example, um, to let's say we, we anoint with oil and nothing changes. It could be that God is saying, use the natural means and the things that I put on earth to heal you. An example of this is in 2 Kings 27, where Hezekiah had been told by the prophet Isaiah that to get his house in order because he was going to die. He turned his face to the wall and he began to cry and, and pray and God, God spoke to the prophet, turned him around and he came back and God said, tell him I've heard his prayer and I will extend his life 15 years. What did he do then? Isaiah, who asked, he said, do you want a sign? And, and had actually God working through him to such a degree, he said, do you, which way do you want the sun to go? Okay. Isaiah didn't lay hands on him. He didn't speak to him and say, be healed. Isaiah said, prepare a mustard poultice. Natural means. Medicinal means. Prepare a mustard poultice and put it on the boil. He'll recover and live 15 more years in, in answer to his prayer. God used natural means. Never discount. Our job, our job as, as Christians and as believers is to operate on the assumption that God wants to heal unless he shows us differently. But we need to determine the pathway to healing. The pathway may very well be through a doctor. The pathway may, it's, it's foolish for me to pray for God and refuse to allow a doctor to take care of me and say, no God, no God's got to do it, God's got to do it, God's got to do it, God's got to do it. When, the, when I have a ruptured appendix and the doctors say, let, let us get you in there, we'll operate on you and we can take care of this and no, God's going to do it. I believe God heals. No, I believe God heals. God does heal, but sometimes he chooses natural means, natural ways. He uses people. Amen? Okay. At times a person being ministered to does not want to be healed. I've seen it more than once. Some people's whole identity is bound up in their sicknesses. That's how they receive their attention. That's, how they, that's who they are. If they weren't sick, they wouldn't have anything to talk about. Right? They give you an organ recital every time you're around them. This organ's hurting, that organ's hurting. Right? I see a lot of nodding heads. Frankly, it's a waste of time to pray for somebody who doesn't want to be healed. Because they'll be resisting. They, they, they are, they want, that's why Jesus in John 5, 6, he went up to the man at the outside hospital, Bethesda. And there were hundreds of people evidently there. He walked up to the one man as we talked about. What did he ask that one man? Do you want to get well? Now Jesus asked that. 
Sometimes people aren't healed because they don't want to be healed. And then finally, lastly, there may be a divinely intended purpose in some sickness. And again, we must be careful and not become spiritually lazy. But one example of this would be, Jesus said in John the ninth chapter, neither, you remember, he said, neither this man sinned nor his parents, but this happened so that the works of God might be displayed in him. There are occasions, and I don't, I, I'm not glorifying sickness, I'm not making sickness a savior, I'm, I'm not saying God, I'm saying it's God's intention to heal, but sometimes sickness can be used by God to even get someone's attention. So there could be a divine purpose, but let's not assume that. Let's assume because God said he wants to heal. Many, every time they said, if you're willing, Jesus said that he was willing. I am willing. You say, well, why isn't everybody healed if God's willing? The same reason God's not willing that any should perish, 2 Peter 3, 9, but that all might come unto repentance, but not everybody's going to be saved. It's God's will that everybody be saved, but not everybody's going to be saved. It's God, God's will that people be healed. But there are some reasons, some we may not know, some we may not know until eternity, that some people are not healed. But until then, God's will is health. He is Jehovah Rophe, Rapha, the Lord our healer. And I believe personally we would see a lot more healings in the church if we assumed that it was God's will to heal and we aggressively pursued it and said we're going to see that person healed. We're going to see that individual healed. I, believe, I still believe that God gives gifts of healing. I believe that. I believe God operates in that manner. I've had him operate in my own life in that manner. And I wish I had time to tell you some of the tremendous miracles other than John that we have seen. People's hearts healed. Um, amazing things that God has taught me down through the years. Stir up the gift. That's what Paul told Timothy. Stir it up. How do you stir it up? Use it. You say, what if I fail? God said to one pastor, he said, if you won't take credit for the healing, then you won't have to take blame if they're not healed. I like that. Don't, don't take credit. You won't have to take blame. All right. God bless you. Thank you, Lord, for this day. We pray now you will help us to transition to the service. May your will be accomplished. We pray for your anointing, your power, your presence to be present here in this room and to be present on that parking lot. May the people pulling in sense the presence of the Almighty God. May you accomplish today what you desire. Kingdom of heaven come, will of God be done. We pray it for the glory of Jesus. Amen.